Okay. How is that? It's a bit washed out. What was that? Oh, okay. We all comfortable with that. Um, how does it look on Zoom? What is that? Oh, it's on time. <laughs> okay, excellent. Hello, everyone. So excited to be here. Uh, my name is Myrene Belisi. Um, I am a postdoctoral researcher at the La Brea Tar Pits and Museum in Los Angeles, as well as the University of California in Merced. California, um, and as well in a few weeks, like next month, I'm starting a new position as the curator of paleontology at the ALF Museum of Paleontology, which is in Claremont, California, so also in Southern California. And this talk um, yeah, summarizes a lot of my work um, over the last few years, uh, focusing on paleontology at a couple of tar pits around the world. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so this is an asphalt bubble. Asphaltic deposits or tar pits present a unique opportunity to study past ecosystems because they preserve many different kinds of fossils and lots of them. Now I have to say that not all asphalt seeps are fossiliferous, but you know, today we'll be focusing on those that are. And um, there are many asphaltic sites around the world where fossils have been discovered, as shown on this slide. And in particular, um, we'll be focusing today in this talk on Rancho La Brea in California. So this is where I currently work, as well as a little bit at the end of this talk on these other asphaltic seeps in Binagari in Azerbaijan, in um, the, middle, the crossroads of the Middle East and Asia. So, Zooming in to Los Angeles, uh, so we are in California. This is a, a site that is relatively close to the coast, um, and it is special for multiple reasons, one of which is, it, is that it's in a very um, urban sort of ecosystem. So this is, um, so the La Brea Tar Pits are the only active urban ice age excavation site um, in North America, if not the world. And so you can see here, there's a bunch of, you know, a bunch of buildings around. Uh, this is a very sort of downtown-y kind of area. And um, so we have a lot of, um, uh, we have a lot of landmarks, uh, such as these reconstructions of a mammoth family. So this site is um, from the last ice age. So this is a, this site preserves a time period from um, about 50,000 years ago um, to 10,000 years ago. And in fact, this asphalt, um, it's very sticky and it keeps entrapping, it has been entrapping animals um, all through that time and even um, into the present day. So if we time travel back to 1914, this is how Rancho La Brea, as it was known back then, this is how it used to look. So here we have oil derricks in the background, um, and in the foreground is a tar seep, or more accurately, an asphalt seep. So this asphalt is the byproduct of the Salt Lake oil field um, that underlies Los Angeles. And uh, this asphalt, which is very much, uh, it's very thick, it's like the crudest version of crude oil. So this asphalt seeps the surface as very sticky pools um, that have entrapped animals, as well as plants over the last 55,000 years. And this is a unique depositional environment that encapsulates ecosystems over time. So we have multiple time capsules. Now, if we were to go back even farther to about um, 55 to 11,000 years ago, this was a very different community. Um, so we have these large animals or megafauna. So shown here on the screen are a giant brown sloth on the right. I'm not sure if you can see that there. 
um, you have a saber toothed cat in the um, in the front middle. Um, you have these giant birds of prey in the upper left, um, and also just shown off screen, there are some dire wolves skulking around. In the far background, there are, there are mammoths and mastodons. And um, so this seems like a very different community, but um, this landscape, the mountains in the background are familiar to many people, even those who are not paleontologists, because um, one might recognize it today as the site of the Hollywood sign. So this landscape unites this narrative from past to present and into the future. So Rancho La Brea, um, we have a wealth of fossils, and this, is a, um, this means not just the number of specimens, but also the different types of species that we have preserved, and also the, um, you know, just the uh, different types of species of animals as well as plants. And there's a lot of analyses that are possible at Rancho La Brea in um, Los Angeles that are not as possible at other fossil localities around the world. And one of those analyses is paleopathology. So generally, paleopathologies are skeletal lesions that are sustained in life from injury or developmental defects. And at the target, we have um, our most abundant animal is the dire wolf. So it was this large, a very large wolf. It's like this size, it, larger than a husky, you know, larger than today's great wolves. And um, we have over 4,000 individuals alone of this animal. And uh, we have enough of this animal um, that we can capture even rare phenomena like pathologies. So here we have some examples of pathologies from dire wolves that um, provide insights on their behavior. So on the lower left, uh, on the left here, we have some shin bones. So this is you know, this part of your body um, that show healed oblique fractures and foreshortening of the bone. So this suggests that these animals, um, because they were running uh, predators, so they were breaking their legs um, because hunting is a dangerous activity. And as a result of that, they, um, you, know, you have these injuries, but the animal had to keep hunting afterwards. And so the, the injuries didn't heal quite right. And you know this was before the time when we had veterinarians. And so um, that's why you have the foreshortening of the bone. So on the right here, um, like middle right, there's a letter D. Uh, that is an example of you know, what a non-pathological direwolf tibia looks like. So you can compare um, the ones that were injured. Now on the right, this group of images that we have here show the lower jaws of the dire wolf. And um, so there's also abscesses and alveolar resorption. So these are pathologies that are um, that tend to happen when an animal um, is crushing hard substances like bone. So for example, if an animal were crunching through bones, you get to the marrow within. Um, so that's evidence of bone cracking and, um, and also crushing the growth crushing the bones of prey larger than themselves because these dire wolves, um, in order to sustain their large body size, they had to um, hunt prey. Um, uh, they had to hunt large megafaunal prey. So altogether, these two pieces of evidence along with um, others from the targets um, suggest that um, these animals had social behavior because um, so first, that they had to hunt animals larger than, than themselves, which is very um, dangerous. And the fact that they would survive um, after, after devastating injuries, such as um, the ones on their leg bones. Um, so that suggests that they had enough of a social structure that these animals were able to heal, even if they didn't, you know, if, even if their bones didn't uh, heal quite right. So this is, um, we have other examples of pathologies preserved at the targets. So this is, uh, so we have enough specimens that we can map out on a skeleton, on a, on here. We can map out on diagrams, like where the hot spots of injury are. And I have to, um, I have to clarify that we do have a lot of bones, but a lot of the time they are disarticulated because of the action of the asphalt um, tends to just, you know, pull bones apart. Um, so we don't necessarily know 
that you know this set of bones is from mm -hmm. one animal. But if you look at the big picture, then you can um, you can aggregate some patterns as shown here. So on the left, we have the saber-toothed cat, which is our second most abundant animal at the La Brea Tar Pits. Um, so again, we have over 4,000 individuals. We have over 2,000 individuals of saber-toothed cat. And we are in active excavation. So these numbers are still growing. We're still continuing to find these animals as well as others. So what is this diagram showing us? Well, the saber tooth on the left, the hot spots of injury, so the reddest parts um, tend to be in the lower back. So this is the lumbar region, um, as well as you know, there's a hot spot also in the rotator cuff of, um, of your shoulder. And the dire wolf on the right, um, the hot spots of injury tend to be in the feet as well as in, um, in the neck. And what this suggests to us is that um, so these injuries reinforce what we had inferred about these animals' hunting behaviors based on other pieces of evidence. So the saber tooth was likely an ambush predator, and um, you know the photos up top are um, well, they're photos, right? So they're based on they're they're uh, modern um, ecosystem photos. <laughs> Too. Okay, excellent. All right, so back to pathologies. Um, so again, saber-toothed cat and dire wolf. Um, and these are modern images of, you know, of living animals, but these are the closest analogs that we think. Um, these are the closest analogs to the behavior of these extinct animals based on um, the patterns of pathology. So the saber tooth was probably wrestling with its prey, grappling with its prey. So imagine, you know, a giant ground sloth um, and the saber tooth um, with its um, powerful limbs like, grappling with that to take it down. Um, so that action would torque your lower back. And that probably is how um, the saber tooth was having um, this hot spot of injury in its lower ribs and lower back, while the dire wolf, because it was a running predator, um, it probably it, you know it might get kicked, um, kicked in the legs or possibly in the face. Um, and let's see, just should I mute the? Okay. Excuse me. Leave it. Okay. All right. So let's keep going. All righty. So, um, so pathologies. These are one, um, yeah, one sort of analysis that we do at the targets that our collections have enable us to to do. And um, just as a last bit on that, so this object is has been described as the most strikingly pathological in the collection of Ranch La Brea fossils. And what we have here is a pelvis of a saber-toothed cat. Um, so you can see that the right side, the left side looks, um, you know, it looks okay. The right side is very deformed. And um, you can see that again um, on this uh, CT scan on the right-hand side, um, which is flipped, but um, the right side of the CT, or the left side of the CT scan is actually the right side. So um, this animal uh, definitely was disabled in its life, um, or it had a disability, and this disability is called hip dysplasia, 
which is a condition that also afflicts, afflicts modern cats. So this was pretty cool when we discovered this because this animal had been studied since, you know, at, for, for over a century now, but it's just that a century ago, we didn't have tools like CT scanning. So back then people thought, okay, this animal must have been injured while hunting and the injury didn't quite heal right. Um, and that's why it got infected, et cetera. But then when we collaborated with orthopedic surgeons um, at a local hospital, um, they ran the, the specimen through a CT scanner. There was no evidence of fracture, uh, which would have been there had the animal um, you know, broken its hip. And instead, you had evidence of this condition called hip dysplasia, which is a developmental condition. This is um, uh, the hip joint doesn't form at all. So it's, it's just um, the animal is born with this and um, it just gets progressively worse over the animal's life. And what's cool about this specimen too is that the animal had grown to a large enough size that it was definitely adult. So again, that suggests to us that, oh, it must have had a family group. It must have had a little bit of help for it to have lived through this, um, through this disability and still been able to um, eat enough to grow to its large size. And uh, an example, a modern example of um, a cat breed that has a lot of hip, uh, high prevalent, prevalence of hip dysplasia is the main pool. All right. So the La Brea Tar Pits, we are a site that's really known for its large carnivore, for our large carnivores. And I just talked about two of the, um, our, our, our two most represented ones, the dire wolf and the saber tooth cat. And this is uh, on the screen right now as part of our most popular, um, arguably most popular exhibit. This is part of a wall of 400 dire wolf skulls. And each skull is a real specimen that was excavated at our site. However, we also have smaller um, specimens, smaller animals, and those are shown here on the screen to scale. Um, so these animals are the gray fox, striped skunk, bobcat, and badger, among others. And um, so the late Pleistocene or the last ice age, this was, um, it's, it's commonly recognized as a time of megafauna. But I also think of it as the last time when megafauna coexisted with mesocarnivores or these small animals or smaller carnivores. And a lot of these mesocarnivores are still around today in, um, in, the, in Southern California. So these include the bobcat, um, the skunk, the gray fox, et cetera. Um, so this has implications not only for paleontology, but also for conservation and ecology and urban management of, of this biodiversity because disturbances keep happening today. So at the end of the last ice age, we had this intersection of climate change, megafaunal extinction and increasing human impacts. And that was, you know, about 10,000 years ago. And it's, you know, now we are, we continue to be in a time of change and we still have the smaller animals around today. So one question is how have they responded back then? And how does that, could that inform um, how they respond in the future? And that's one question that I've been, um, that's the question that I've been studying most recently at the Tar Pits. Uh, so first of all, I wanted to know um, when were the mesocarnivores preserved? Um, so we have, we have their fossils, but do those fossils date from around the same time? Carnivores. And so on the vertical axis here, we have time. And on the horizontal axis, we have the different um, species that we have of mesocarnivore. And the orange line, the dashed line, is um, that's the, the end of the last ice age. That's that. So generally, gray foxes, bobcats, and striped skunks seem to be older at the tar pits, um, ranging from 30,000 to 40,000 years, most of them. Uh, badgers are youngest. They tend to be um, after that boundary, right? So pretty high in, in, the, um, in the time section. Weasels tend to be all over. That's this large gray bar here. 
So we have only four weasels dated. So one would think, okay, if there were only four of them, they're, you know, they must be pretty clustered, but no, they, they are all over the place, which might be a size thing. Maybe the smaller you are, the you more easily get entrapped. It's a work in progress. And what's exciting about this is that collection is still ongoing. So again, we are an active excavation site and one of our um, active projects is Project 23, which is a, a mitigation project. So it started when the, the art museum next door um, was excavating for an underground parking structure and ran into fossils because that's what happens when you excavate in LA. And uh, one of the new finds from that excavation is this raccoon um, named Lennox. Uh, so it wasn't always named Lennox. We had nicknamed it Rona uh, because we excavated it just before COVID. But we then took this raccoon skull um, and we have an education department at my museum. And so um, the education department um, opened up this contest for local um, for local, uh, yeah, for local schools, um, and invited school teachers to lead their classes to suggest names. And this was the winning name. Um, we thought that it was a great, um, you know, a great way to get the students to think about the natural history and ecology of raccoons, which of course we still have in Los Angeles today. And today we think of them as trash pandas, but this fossil on the screen is from deposits that are about 30 to 50,000 years old. So this raccoon is probably from that time. We, we still have to date it, um, but we have a suspicion that it might be that old. Okay, so this is the chronology of mesocarnivores at the tar pits. So animals like gray foxes and bobcats. Um, and so now we have a time scaffold on which we can look at questions like size change over time. So um, here we have on the vertical axis for each of these plots, we have size based on the length, based on a tooth um, length, um, which is a common size proxy for um, in, in fossils where you can't see how big an animal is. So you look at the teeth. Um, and what we see here is that most of these species decreased in size from fossils to modern day. Um, except for the long-tailed weasel. But if you'll remember from the previous slide, the long-tailed weasel spans through time. So, you know, if we look at the, it makes sense that there's no difference in the long-tailed weasel in size because there's no difference in time either. So generally, um, there are different magnitudes of size decrease. So the bobcat decreased the most. Uh, this is a small, um, a small, very carnivorous um, animal. And the, uh, the badger decreased the least. And that might be explained by, well, most of our badgers are, you know, relatively young. So the difference in time between the fossil and modern badgers is smaller than the difference in time between the fossil and modern bobcats, for example. So um, we have, so my training is an, as an ecologist and evolutionary biologist. So I'm thinking about these changes, like how to explain them in terms of ecology, right? So um, generally, we have two groups of hypotheses for how to, uh, to, to potentially explain these changes. One is ecological. Um, so perhaps mesopredator release when the megafauna um, went extinct, perhaps that eased some pressure off of the mesocarnivores. So then they were released into larger niches, perhaps. Or it could be a bottom up pressure. So it could be a shift in prey availability that could have happened at that same time. Um, the other hypothesis that we have is environmental. So it could be changes in aridity or soil hardness. So for example, if you look at the striped skunk and the American badger, um, we see changes in their, um, in their post crania as well and the rest of their bodies that suggest changes in locomotor behavior. So changes in how they dig, for example. So what could be leading to those changes? Well, it could be you know, soil, um, differences in soil properties, et cetera. All right, we can also run these other analyses on them. So stable isotopes, which are uh, biogeochemical analyses that um, in this case, I'm using them to infer what the animals ate and did. And has that changed over time? So time here is on the horizontal axis. 
And um, again, we have that that dashed orange line that is the um, that's the boundary between um, the last ice age and after. Um, and on the vertical axis, we have this variable 13C. And generally this variable tells us like what sorts of plants were they eating? Like on a continuum, um, yeah, there's, um, you know, there's a continuum of different types of plants. And what this suggests is that there's an apparent widening of the ecological niche um, after the uh, after the that boundary, so this could reflect a plant community shift, which other uh, which colleagues at the Tarpits seem to be finding, or it could just be species turnover because there's you know most of the post Pleistocene animals are badgers, so it could be that. Um, now, if we look at nitrogen, which is typically taken to mean um, to, to indicate the amount of meat in an animal's diet. So generally the more carnivorous an animal, the higher up in nitrogen is gonna be. And um, so there seems to be a narrowing as well as a downward shift. If you go from the left to the right into that boundary in um, Delta 15N. So yes, that could mean animals were getting less carnivorous. However, this shift seems to be recorded as well in other animals at the tar pits that are being studied by other colleagues. And so we're starting to think now that this might be a shift in baseline nitrogen availability. So this might be an ecosystem um, level shift. And this is ongoing work. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, this, this story continues to evolve. And part of that story is um, I'm currently assembling um, a modern data set of, um, of these mesocarnivores. Um, just to figure out like how much of this is ecosystem and how much of this is the actual animals changing their diet. Okay, so all of that was the tar pits in Los Angeles. And I have a few slides here now um, talking about tar pits in very different place, um, Azerbaijan. So this is in uh, Southwestern Asia um, on this peninsula that juts out into the Caspian Sea. And the chief prehistoric, uh, the chief fossil deposit among them is near the city, the capital city of Baku. Um, let's see, you can see that. And um, yeah, so like the tar pits in Los Angeles, the Azerbaijani asphalt seeps all birds and other animals, even in the modern day. So here we have, um, for example, in the upper left, we have a photo of a duck that was trapped. Um, we have footprints probably from a cow, and the photo below the, uh, the footprints is a cow, um, as well as a snake that was entrapped. So all of these, um, you know, modern day entrapments also used to happen hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, uh, and this entrapment um, has preserved the remains of countless organisms over the last hundreds of thousands of years at the um, at this seat near Baku, it's called Binagari. And um, so this deposit is older than the La Brea Tar Pits because um, the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles, um, we have been, or they have been um, entrapping animals over the last 55,000 years at least. So Binagari in Azerbaijan has been entrapping um, from at least 190,000 years ago to potentially 250,000 years ago. So um, the Binagari seep, um, it has, um, it has kind of dried up now. So it, it entrapment doesn't happen there anymore. Um, but the first scientific excavations were carried out or, um, yeah, almost a hundred years ago now from 1938 to 1953. Uh, so the left-hand photo was taken in 1940 um, when rhinoceros bones from several animals were recovered, um, but only a small portion of the site has been explored because on the right-hand side, uh, the remains of the seep, um, so this is hardened and weathered now, um, so the seeps are beneath the buildings of a settlement um, that is now uh, set up there. So here are some examples of Pleistocene fossils from Binagari. So on the left, we have a gray wolf skull and mandible. Um, so at Ranch La Brea in Los Angeles, a lot of our, most of our animals um, 
belong to predators or even scavengers. And uh, the mechanism that we, that we, how we explain that is that um, these predators or scavengers were probably attracted to animals that had become entrapped by the asphalt only for the predators then to be entrapped themselves. Um, and it seems to be that same way uh, um, in, uh, with the Binagari seeps in Azerbaijan because they have a lot of these gray wolves as well. In the middle, we have another mammal species, a narrow-nosed rhinoceros. Um, so it's restored using bones from a number of different individuals. Um, this is how we do things at the Librea Tarpets as well, because again, the bones tend to be disarticulated by the asphalt over time. And um, Binagari also has these eagle bones um, on the right here. Um, so these eagle bones, um, you know, they all like the La Brea bones, they, they have this asphaltic, this dark asphalt um, uh, color. So one of the future things that I would like to do is to potentially compare um, Binagari and La Brea. Um, so Binagari reconstruction is on the left, La Brea reconstruction is on the right. Um, there seem to be parallels, but as um, my colleague Dr. Mikhailo will um, explore more, um, there are also definitely differences among different asphalt seeps all over the world. And um, yeah, so this talk has been about Ranch La Brea and in, in Los Angeles, California, and Binagari near Baku in Azerbaijan. And I think it is time to talk about Trinidad asphalt seeps. I'll we'll hold to question, all questions at the end just for the back and forth Sure, I'm sharing. Is it still share? The Zoom screen still sharing? Okay. All right. Everyone's good. We can all see. Can you all hear me? Okay. Great. All right. Thank you all again so much for coming this rainy Saturday morning. Um, I'm really excited to give you all some updates on the work that we've been doing here in Trinidad. Oh. Wrong screen. Yeah, do you want to do this one? No. Oh. Yeah. Um, no, or no, that's fine. Fine. I don't have any notes, so it doesn't matter. Um, oh, Zoom. I think I'm just gonna go with it. Because I can do what I did. Right. Sure. I don't want, I don't need presenter view. Okay. Um, so in that case, I can just turn off presenter view for you. Okay. Sure. Oh, she was going to. So good. Okay, great. So what exactly is an asphaltic deposit? We just heard a lot about those we know a little bit better than the one we know in Trinidad, so in Los Angeles, California. And then we also heard about one that maybe we know still just a little bit more than we know about Trinidad over in Azerbaijan. Um, but an asphaltic deposit in general is a place where asphalt seeps up to the surface from underground. So if you imagine going out onto a field where there's oil underground, as there's certainly the case in Southern Trinidad, right there are these oil fields, you have places where because of geologic accident, 
um, that asphalt can actually come up to the surface. And so when it does that, it can get into all of the dirt, it can get into organisms. And if you're lucky, over thousands of years, it can protect those things as fossils. And the reason why we're so excited that there are these types of deposits in Trinidad is that normally in humid places, fossils don't tend to preserve very well. So because this asphalt goes into the bone, it literally keeps the water out and so we have a little time capsule of what was living thousands of years ago. And we've kind of come up over the years and looking around the world with a general recipe for how to make a tar pit or asphalt deposit. It's not so much like this SpongeBob here who tends to get stuck. It's not like soupy, it's not like pitch lake, but rather it's a place where you have just a little bit of asphalt coming up through the ground and eventually you get some really sticky dirt, maybe a little asphalt at the top. And again, over thousands of years, that asphalt can kind of solidify everything together. And you need to have the asphalt, you need to have water movement in the area. So when we're out in the field, we look for things like creeks and rivers nearby. And we also need to see something like faulting, again, that geologic accident, the movement of um, the rocks underground that will release that asphalt. And the reason we love these types of deposits is because they, as Mary noted, can connect the past and present beautifully because they preserve all types of things, not just bones, but also plants, um, even little insects, mollusks, and of course the sediment the, itself. So you get this whole time capsule of an entire ecosystem as it changes over time. And this is really important for studying things like climate change or trying to understand how species may have interacted with each other in the past. So again, there are a number of tar pit sites around the world and we're very fortunate in this hemisphere to have most of them. So we learned about one in California, um, within the United States, there's also one in the state of Oklahoma, which is kind of near Texas. Then there's a number in South America, as well as in the Caribbean. We just have so far from Trinidad and also from Cuba. And this is again, special geology of these places. Within Trinidad, as you probably may know, North and South look very different, right? The ecosystems, the landscapes, and that's due to this different geologic history across the island. And in turn, because you have different geologic history across the island, it means that you might be able to find different types of fossils or do different types of studies. So depending on the questions that you are interested in, you may want to go to different parts of the island. So in our case, we're really, of course, here for the tar pits fossils. And that's why we focus on Southern Trinidad where all the oil fields are. Again, because of this geologic history. And Southern Trinidad, millions of years ago, was really built by sediments flowing from what is today the Orinoco Delta. So when we look at the rocks that are in Southern Trinidad, we see evidence of this ancient Delta. And over time, these sediments built up, kind of building this foundation for where we might see fossils in the future. So when we're thinking about where should we excavate, where should we look for fossils, knowing this history helps us understand where we might find some of them. So here's just a slightly more detailed version of this where you can see in these different colors, the different geologic formations and their different ages across Southern Trinidad. So what's important about this is that you can see on this, we know the ages of these rocks, right? Because we're interested in a particular time period, we need to go look for rocks that are also of that particular age. And so again, finding all of these intersections where we have this ancient delta that also has onshore oil deposits and the rocks are also of the right age. So that's why we as a team have really settled on looking at South Trinidad for these types of fossils. We've done a bit of exploring. 
So certainly the first thing we did when we got to Trinidad was go to Pitch Lake because obviously how could you not if you're interested in asphalt? And it was amazing. It's totally unlike anything we have in Los Angeles, but we don't think there's going to be a lot of big mammal fossils coming out of it because of the way the sediments are forming there. Instead, we think our best bet is the site Forest Reserve as well as some other sites in that surrounding area where you can see asphalt still coming to the surface in some places, but also the rocks are the right age and there's also water movement that indicates in the past there would have been sediment and maybe bones coming together and forming a deposit. So while we love Pitch Lake, and I think there's a lot of really cool things that can be studied, including the archaeology from that site, as well as the ecology, for paleontology, it's, it's not top of our list right now. The places that we do have fossils from are, again, all in southern Trinidad. We have Forest Reserve, which is located, I don't know if my pointer works here, but just basically down around here. Um, Los Bajos is also a historically reported site. We actually can't relocate based on the original field notes, the original site they found fossils, but we have a general sense of where. There's also a place called Apex Oil Field, which is, I think, very close to Forest Reserve. So again, in Southern Trinidad, but because as I'll mention, this material was collected about a hundred years ago, the notes are not very detailed. And then lastly, we have one piece of sloth from a mud volcano in Karama. So again, how do we choose an excavation site? First, it requires going out and doing a lot of looking and exploring, but really the key ingredient, aside from going outside in the field and literally poking around in some cases, is to know a lot about the geology. So you can see here a geologic map where Really, everything we need is in Southern Trinidad. We have the oil, the faulting, and then things of Pleistocene age, ice age sediments for us to go looking to answer these research questions. So what exactly are the questions we can start asking in Trinidad? Because the site that we just heard about in Los Angeles has been studied for literally over a hundred years. And so the types of questions that we heard about in terms of injuries of animals or how species interacted over time in response to extinction. Right? Those are questions that you need a lot of bones and specimens to answer. So we need to do some catching up in terms of the work here in Trinidad. The questions that I think are really important and I would love to hear what you all think are important too is first trying to know what were the ecosystems of late Pleistocene Trinidad and Tobago like? Like, what did they look like? If you stood here thousands of years ago, what would you see? And how would that compare to other places in the Caribbean or in South America, right? Trying to understand how Trinidad fits into this bigger picture of change in the region. Then we might also want to know how did climate change impact this island in the past? I think this is really important because we're now seeing so many impacts from human caused climate change today. And so by actually looking at these fossils in the past, we can have some clues for understanding how animals and plants on this island survived or didn't once before when climate changed. And lastly, I think many people tend to get very excited about this one. Where did all the big mammals go? Like, why don't we still have um, all of these giant armadillo relatives on the island today, for example. And I think what's really exciting about partnering with an organization like the National Trust is we can take all of this fossil information, which on its own is amazing and really useful in education, but then try and help us understand what the present is in the context of that past. So a place like Arepo Savanna, is that a leftover from the Ice Age or is that something new due to more recent climate change. Overview of how Trinidad's fossils have been explored in the past, how we're doing something a little different now, and also what we're trying to do in the future. So interestingly, around the same time people were looking for fossils in Los Angeles, 
looking for oil is really what they were doing first. They only found fossils in Los Angeles because they were there for the oil. And the same thing, to be honest, is the case here in Trinidad as well. So starting in the early 1900s up until 1950, there was a lot of oil exploration, especially through some British companies in Southern Trinidad. And when they went to go put these drills in, they sometimes encountered animal bones or insects and fossils. And so at the time, there's a paper from 1920 where someone working for the oil company found some beautiful fossil insects, sent it back. We don't know where those fossils are. We don't know where the site actually is because the notes were not very good, unfortunately. Same case goes again for a elephant relative tooth that was found by an oil company and sent out of the country. Then in 1950, there was also some work and they found a glyptodon carapace, huge, huge animal that's a relative of a giant. Basically, it looks like a giant armadillo. And so all of these have for the most part been sent outside the country when they were uh, being explored and for oil um, production. The only exception is that there are some fossils just down the street at the National Museum and Art Gallery that we think are from one of these early oil exploration sites. But again, because at the time this was done by people who were really just there as part of the company and not doing science, they didn't take the notes we would take today. So these early explorations really led to a lot of things being sent outside the country. Here's just some examples, just to, because we, once I read these papers, I was like, we gotta find these items. Like, can we track down these specimens that left Trinidad decades ago? And so I found one of them, a specimen from Los Bajos. This is actually an elephant relative's tooth that's now in a museum in Switzerland. And then that giant carapace that came out of the ground, which you can see there, we found it in a museum in Milwaukee in Wisconsin in the US. So somehow it went from the oil company to the American Museum of Natural History, we think, which then traded it to a museum in Wisconsin. So we've been working to try and find these old fossils, but it's really hard because they don't have a strong paper trail. So after that period, starting in 1960 is when we had more formal scientific exploration, but this was done largely by people, again, outside of the country, unfortunately. And so from 1960, they, um, a graduate student from the University of Florida did an amazing job looking at Forest Reserve, the very same site where that carapace came from. And her thesis really described for the first time what was found on Trinidad in the ice age, including that glyptodon as well as some giant sloths. And the material from her excavation went to the University of Florida, where it's currently um, in the Florida Museum's paleontology department. So there are some materials there. Then in the 1980s and again in 2000, there were some US researchers who re and then re re opened the site forest reserve where that glyptodon came out of where we knew there were sloths. And um, they did all of these excavations legally, but at the time there was no kind of imperative to keep fossils in the country. And so the fossils left to be used in research. And up until that point, they had been sitting since 1980 or since 2000 in some institutions in the US. And this is where um, Ryan and I and our colleagues um, have tried to come in to say, hey, we know that you did some excavations some decades ago. Are you still using that material? You know, we know it was legally obtained, but if you're not using it anymore, could we bring it to Trinidad so local students could work on this material so we could jumpstart research here instead? And so for the past few years now, we've been coordinating with different institutions to try and get some of this material so we can A, get it all kind of collected, photographed, scanned, do some more modern research on it, and then also bring it here so it can stay here and be used for research, for teaching, um, really with the goal of it inspiring people here to think about paleontology as a research option. And so here are some examples of the specimens that's sloth tooth and a sloth jaw. 
So in 2019, and then again in 2021, we had the specimen sent to Los Angeles at the time, and then later to Vermont, where we could scan them and identify them with experts at the La Brea Tar Pits. Um, unfortunately, we got one batch of the fossils here, but then unfortunately, because of COVID, of course, things slowed down a bit. We couldn't really travel with them. And it's really important for these fragile items that they're hand carried. So we actually put them in our carry-on and take them on the plane. So if you ever see me in the airport sometimes, my bag may or may not have fossils coming to, back, to live here. Um, because again, they're just so fragile. We don't want to lose them. We don't want them getting lost in the mail or getting broken. And so they're hand carried. So one time I had a suitcase full of fossils. Ryan's had a suitcase full of fossils um, to, that's been brought here to now be studied and used um, for education here in Trinidad. That's up until this point. Starting now, uh, thinking about some future excavations as well as new analyses. So for example, we have some unprepared sediment material that was collected in 2000. We've been doing some preliminary work to try and understand how that can help us better tell the story of Forest Reserve with the goal of having students help us uh, prepare that material in the future, potentially in January, um, if collaborators here are amenable to that. Again, we also want to, now it would be like the third time that someone's looked at Forest Reserve, but we don't think everything's been taken out of that site yet. So we think there's potential for more giant sloths or even some predator species to be there still. We have funding to do that. And so that's something we'd be excited to include people on. We're also working to scout new localities to excavate for the first time. Really the thing we need to think about here is how do we reach out to and engage with oil companies? Because again, the asphalt fossils are really tied to this oil company activity. So they need to be our partners in this. And lastly, it's even though paleontology is obviously the thing for fossils, when we're talking about these asphalt seeps, they're still active. And there's something that's really unique, right? There's only a few places around the world where you can find them. So I think it's a really amazing research direction for local students here at UE or other institutions that they could be studying how things could eventually become a fossil if they get in track today. So what do we know so far? I know some of you have been to some of my previous talks, others are new. So I just wanna get everyone up to speed. Based on the work of the previous excavations from the 1900s all the way up to now, we know that the vertebrate community had a lot of big mammals, probably very similar to what was found in Venezuela at the time. So again, things like these giant armadillo relatives. We also had giant elephant relatives. Uh, we had giant sloths, extinct llama relatives. We haven't found a carnivore yet, but that's because in general, carnivores tend to be very rare as fossils. And so far, our most common item that we see are these glyptodon scutes, which you can see there in the corner. Um, because it, they're pieces of that armor of that giant armadillo. And so we tend to find lots of little pieces of them. But we focused a lot on the big mammals. And one thing that I think is really exciting is this idea of looking at some of the smaller animals when we go and try to look for new fossils. And that's because the smaller animals can tell us a lot about local climate. So again, if we want to know about climate change, we want to know um, not just the big mammals, but the whole ecosystem. So we do have one small rodent from Trinidad. It's this rodent here laying on the block. Um, it's called Zygodontomies. It's actually a species that's around today that's associated with grasslands. And so because we know today that species is associated with grasslands, perhaps that's a clue that in the past, Southern Trinidad had some of these more open environments. We also have a single bird bone so far. So again, we wanna work on looking at these other taxa. In terms of the plants, we know very little to nothing. The only thing we have is that indirect clue from the rodent. So some of the ongoing research that we're doing is actually looking at ancient pollen that's been trapped in the sediment, as well as what are called phytoliths, which um, you can see in this diagram here, basically when a plant is developing, um, it actually can form these little hard pieces with silica 
particularly grasses often do that. And they make these very distinctive little shapes of silica that can preserve for thousands of years. And so between the pollen grains that get preserved and these phytoliths, we can actually reconstruct what the site would have looked like in terms of the plants. A very good question is how old the site is. And right after that glyptodon carapace, the giant armadillo carapace was found for, by the oil companies in the 50s, they send a piece of wood to go get radiocarbon dated. And this is some of the earliest radiocarbon technology that's around. And so we didn't really put a lot of faith in this date, but it came back about 30,000 years old, right? The wood was associated with various beetles and bones of glyptodon and megatherium, which is a giant ground sloth. So we were going off of the assumption that it would be about that age, but we weren't sure how much to trust that date. So we instead, uh, did our own radiocarbon analyses on some twigs and charcoal that was found, right? And based on these new dates, most of them date back to about 50,000 years old or potentially a little older, but one of the dates came back at about 30,000. So it's definitely late Pleistocene. It's definitely the time of glyptodons and giant ground salts and saber-toothed cats but we're still trying to narrow down exactly what the time window was that this site can tell us about. We've also done some, sorry. Geochemical analyses to try and understand what the sediments themselves are made of. So here's a very, intense looking graph, but really the most important piece is that it tells you that there's a lot of quartz in the sediment. And that's important because quartz is associated with sandstone, which we know is the type of rock from that delta, from that ancient delta built that sandstone. So it's all very consistent with there being this fossil bed, a single bed of fossils built into this environment in Southern Trinidad. And we've also been really interested in the process of fossilization. It appears very different than the tar pits in Los Angeles. And in particular, the animals probably didn't die in asphalt. Rather, the animals died many years earlier and by chance asphalt came into the sediments. And one clue to that is that the bone itself is very brittle. And you can also see even root development on the bones. So there's been soil formation occurring around the bones itself. One thing we want to know is were animals and plants tra being trapped at the same time? Can you use a radiocarbon date on a plant to infer the age of the animal nearby? Or are they separate ages because of how the fossils have been forming? But what's really helpful already about the data we have is that it's actually validated a hypothesis um, from the woman who did her PhD in 1960. So there were two potential options for how this site formed. First, that it was an old swamp that infilled with sediment in the Pleistocene. And second, that maybe it's actually much older from the Pliocene, so millions of years old, not thousands of years. But based on all of the data we've collected so far from these old excavations, no new excavations, we think it's a case where it was this kind of uh, swampy or pond environment that was in Southern Trinidad that animals died in, that asphalt then started to mix in with from underground. So I just wanna note that we definitely don't think we've sampled this site adequately. So this is a typical diagram you might use if you're an ecologist, trying to see if you've sampled something accurately. Basically what I'm showing you is for number of specimens, how many new genera or a genus, like a genus of mammal do you get? So if I have a whole bucket of bones from this site, each, is each new specimen I pull out a new species? Or do I keep just getting glipped it on, glipped it on, glipped it on, glipped it on? Because you can imagine the more effort you put into sampling, the more new species you'll find. But at a certain point, you'll have found them all, right? And what we find is that 
some of these other sites in South America, like Talara from Peru, they found all that they're probably going to find. But for Forest Reserve, we have barely scratched the surface using these quantitative methods. So the overall emerging picture and why we need more data is that we want to know, is this ecologically similar to a place like Arequa Savannah? But from the age of the deposit, it seems like this site is before human arrival on the island, but it was a time when Trinidad was still connected to South America. So maybe there's some questions we can ask about how sea level rise impacted these ecosystems, right? Because then eventually Trinidad became an island. I think this is really important because it can serve as an ecological baseline for understanding what the history of Trinidad is, especially with all of the different agriculture practices that have happened, right? It can be really hard to know what is natural for an area, but the fossils give us a really great view of that. And I'll just um, end in two slides. First, by noting that we're still trying to find some of these older specimens. So um, we found these two items in Basel, Switzerland, including this kind of elephant relative tooth. That might be something we could contact them and see if they'd be interested in doing a similar thing where they um, give us the specimen to bring back. There's also a specimen potentially at the Smithsonian of a glyptodon, but from Tobago, from Robinson Crusoe Cave. And that would be really cool because it means you have glyptodon, you have giant armadillo from both of the islands. So it kind of unites the two islands um, in this deeper time history. So that's something that we will continue to work on. So how else can you be involved? What else can we study? Uh, this is a photo of a workshop that we did in 2019. It was awesome. It was so much fun. I was so excited by all of the people who came out. And it's unfortunate that COVID kind of slowed our progress down. But for us, in terms of paleontology, we're going to try and relocate some of these older sites try to reopen forest reserve, but really we need to be working with these oil companies to have permission to access these lands. So that's a key focus for us here is how to collaborate with a lot of different groups to just show how many fossils can mean to different groups here. And then of course there's also the opportunity for ecologists. So whether it's looking at asphalt entrapment, microbes, mud volcanoes, there's space for everyone who's interested in this type of work, and we're excited to think about what you want to learn from it and you want to bring to the study. Um, so with that, I will thank you all and turn it over to Brian. Could probably take a five minute break if anyone needs to use the washroom so I could get my parents here as well. Hmm? The, the washroom is around the back. Inside there, you can act the gentleman at the entrance. She's on Thompson, Murray. Yeah, that's right. We have some people in the
Okay, so I guess we can resume in about a minute time. We missing anyone? One other person? How you doing, Marie? I have a very well, thank you. I'm sorry, I was a few minutes late. I was upstairs. Mm. I was fortunate that because of the rain, we started to be yeah. 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 right. so, uh, After the, the um, session here, we can chat with you a bit because we have some pending issues okay. for the museum. Oh, okay. New development. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't have much time because I have a class at 1 o'clock. So like to, uh, okay. Uh, you, um, uh, you come to train session on Tuesday? Uh, yes, yes. All right, we'll chat then. Okay, we'll chat then. Yes. Yeah. All right. Morning again, everyone. So Make sure correcting sharing. Okay. So we spoke a lot so far about um, the various fossils, the various excavation sites around the world. Um, Alexis mentioned some of the fossils found in Trinidad. But when the fossils actually come to Trinidad, when they're repatriated, what happens then? The fossils, they, they go in a shelf, they go on a shelf, they go in a drawer. How do we turn these items into real data? And this data, how do we make sure it's accessible for other researchers? And this is where the accessioning process starts. So let's make sure. So we have here one of the fossils that was repatriated. Right, so we have here one of the fossils that was repatriated back in 2019. Without this ID tag, it will be very difficult for us to get any information out of this specimen. It might as well be a paperweight, a very old and, to me, expensive paperweight. But to someone else, it might just be a rock. This ID tag is what makes this item even more valuable than, than it just being, I mean, we'll have to start over the carbon dating process, the, ex, the, the, the cleaning process to get to figure out what it was, etc. So when the fossils actually come to a museum or to any organization in which they would then reside, having the right data is very important. But just simply having an ID tag 
It's just a label on a shelf. You go to a morgue, everybody has a label, but it doesn't mean that we have any real pathology data or anything that is relative to that specimen. So then we have, we now have the accession in process, different screen. So the accession in process means that your specimens must have respective data attached to it. And from this very large Excel file, the expectation is not for you all to read everything on this Excel file, but to show you all the types of details that is needed to make a biological specimen, a paleontological specimen, a real item of data rather than just an item of curiosity. So several of the fossils, so far there has been two batches of fossils that have been repatriated to the UE Zoology Museum. And this list here shows what has been repatriated. But as you can see, not all cells have been filled. And that's for two reasons, one, we don't have all the information for all specimens as yet. If you scroll further down, you'll see some of the, the, the genus types, we might only have a, a items identified at the family level. We might have some identified to the genus level, but not to the species level. So this is where one, it justifies the need to do further excavations so we could get more fossils, so we could do comparative anatomy work with organisms that we have in different uh, collections. It highlights the need to have collaborative work with other institutions that have a large anatomy collection um, for comparative anatomy work. But it also shows that without a proper accession. All we have are drawers of rocks. Valuable rocks, but drawers of rocks. So So once we know, and once we have all our specimens accessioned, that just, that just means we have an Excel file. Where does this Excel file, where does all of this data be stored? So there are various international databases like GBIF, where this information could then freely be accessioned, uh, accessed by anyone in public. So we have an interesting scenario with fossils in Trinidad. We have some fossils at the National Art Gallery collection, um, a few buildings away. We have some specimens at the UE, Zoe, UE Zoological Museum. There's even been uh, um, talk of a few specimens 
that uh, the head, what was the headquarters of Petrotrin a while back. But there's no one cohesive database of all the fossils as yet. And this is what we try, we're trying to achieve right now. Now, it doesn't mean all the fossils need to be in the same place, okay? For instance, the last batch of fossils that was repatriated to Trinidad, it will reside here at the National Trust, okay? But it doesn't mean that will be a separate database. It will all be one large database accessioned in one single file, one chronological order indicating a unique identification number, as you see here, let me zoom. Every item will have a unique identification number. But again, re-emphasize, doesn't mean all the specimens have to be in the same place, okay? So for instance, once fossils uh, start to reside here, they will still be included into this database that will be loaded onto the GBIF, the International Database for Biodiversity, okay? But what is the benefit of that? The benefit of that is one, you want to ensure people of Trinidad and Tobago have access to viewing of the fossils, okay? They can view fossils at a museum, but it will at the National Art Gallery, but it will be limited amount of fossils in terms of biodiversity. They could view at the UE Zoology Museum, but that museum isn't set up for public access, free access. When I say free access, easy access. Okay, that's a that's a research collection largely with some display capabilities. So with fossils being housed here, it means that all persons, particularly members of the National Trust, but also members of the general public, will have access to view the fossils as well. Having one cohesive database, however, means that any researcher that wants to get information about any specimen knows exactly where it is housed and when it was collected and all the other associated information, okay? It also means for further research, whether it be from people that might be from the University of Trinidad and Tobago, University of the West Indies, or foreign researchers that want to come and do work on fossils, there is now a procedure to follow how to access the fossils. Because we at the National Trust, we are now putting things in place to have these all fossils that have been accessioned be listed as heritage items which means it would be an item of importance to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And I, I, I make, make particular mention of Tobago now, because as Alexis pointed out, there has been fossils found in Tobago, okay? Now, the unique, the interesting thing to me about this item in Tobago, the, the glyptodon scoot that was found in Tobago, yes, it shows the land bridge that, that once connected between Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago, but as, as much as in the last three years, recent work I did on Caymans between Trinidad, Tobago, and South America, what we learned was that the Caymans in Tobago was more related to Caymans in South America than in Trinidad. So it could mean that what we have in Tobago was actually a closer, closely related to what's in South America rather than what's in Trinidad. But again, this just goes to show how much more we'll need to do on these fossils to show the relationships ecologically as well as historically, okay? So with that being said, I think now we could start the open floor discussions about where do we go from here? What was the purpose of today's meeting? I'll be honest with you, I had an agenda. My agenda was to start to get people interested in the next excavations, which I believe we want to target in January, 2023, if all goes well, all right? But for that, we need people. It won't just be led by us three and other people from the, lab the Liberia um, Tapet and Museum. This is where we need to have more people involved from Trinidad and Tobago. And we want to start that discussion to hear what you all are interested in 
one, and two, find out from you all what would your concerns be, what are, what are your questions with regards to doing new excavations. I could tell you up front, we would really like to have three key player organizations involved. The three key player organizations would be the National Trust, the UE Zoology Museum, or, or the UWI in general, and also La Brea Tarpets and Museum. But the logistics that would come to make that happen, we still have to work that out. But it still doesn't mean we won't start the process now of getting people interested in the excavations, all right? How do we build a network of people? What, uh, what training you all might need in preparation for that? What questions you might have? Okay, so uh, I think we could open this one now. Okay. So, so that Excel file I showed would be on the UE database. Uh, I think they, um, I forget the name of the software they use. However, that software, that file is, is replicated on GBIF as well. So you don't have to go through the UE um, zoology museum network for, for to look at all the specimens to find that information. And UE currently has a grant from GBIF to upload all their data onto that, onto that platform. So all fossil data will be accessioned, uh, that is accessioned, that UE collection will be uploaded, which also means fossils that house at the National Trust should be on that database as well. So there, there should be no barrier at least to access data. That's where you can upload pictures of plants and animals you see on the side, and the researchers can use it. And so, not only the scientists in the museum, but also any person who takes a photo can find it. So, it's a really cool way to draw it into our access. Yeah. Um, like we'll have trouble. Um, Getting information from somebody who has real thought that ultimately your society as well. That's one of the organizations we, we need to meet and have discussions with. Um, Xavier has Monan has been easy to have discussions with thus far. So um, hopefully he will be the first person in contact and then go from there. Okay, yeah, because it seems like be like a, 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 a easy end. Yeah. Yeah, uh, they were the first people actually when I was interested in working, so I reached out to them to you know, like talk with them. I think there's been a lot of, at least turnover with the oil companies themselves. So initially when we started working, So, so I think it's something like that. The National Trust definitely would 
want to pitch directly to them instead of as, as an individual the, the trust could be yeah so that's the okay. 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 Jal, who, who's the current president? Because my point in person, who, no, you, no, used no, to be Zavi. Okay. 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 Okay, for example, they have foundations, but they need to. This is where you could direct your project or on the ground. Yeah. You have to be the best in this one. Ten thousand dollars, five thousand, no need to ask. Yeah. And for that, that's kind of good to work with you. So we did approach, um, we, we approached Touchstone initially, but when we did, when they overviewed the maps of where the areas are that we have interest in, that's when re they realized that it was actually heritage areas that we are interested in. So, yeah, that's a bigger picture. Yeah. It's not your property being interesting in the concept of yeah. your buying the human development yeah. and education, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So we had we had that discussion already. Now we need to go the further step. And that, and that discussion was with the with various council members and staff at the National Trust and Touchstone at the time. But yeah, we have to do the follow up on it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sir. So that, that, that's something we need to work out. It, um, if it's on a voluntary basis or if there will be a, any sort of stipend associated. Oh, open to the public. Yeah. Um, hold on, eh? just, just really benefit that the online people, they wanted to get the questions repeated. So the questions was, um, if there's people from the public that wants to be involved with the, with the excavations, how would that happen? And Alexis indicated that we'll try to look at funding to get to get where students participating on the, on the digs in the future. And Jal Jaladin Khan indicated if we decide if we wanted to touch base with any of the other oil companies and also the, the uh, petroleum conference that is coming up in January, that might be an avenue for us to gain the airs of these oil companies. Geology conference. Yeah. Oh yeah, energy conference was last week. Yeah. 
All right. Um, um, Yeah. Right. So, so the question is that we need to figure out better mechanisms to engage the public about fossil work, fossil workshops, fossil excavations. Um, we have three avenues to address this public engagement. One is the National Trust. Okay. Um, the National Trust staff, once they get information in time, and I must emphasize in time, and I mean when it falls on me making sure the trust staff gets information in time to publicize, it will be publicized on the trust website, trust Facebook page, etc. The second avenue is the Trinidad and Tobago Field Naturalist Club, which is the other organization, the other NGO we partner with. They had a significant uh, number of members that came to the workshop, the in-person workshop that we held at UV in, back in 2019. And again, they have a large outreach base as well. The third avenue will be through UWE. So once we engage UWE and, and UWE wants to play ball, it's up to UWE to disseminate the information in the way that they see fit. We have some influence on the National Trust and the Trinidad and Tobago Field Naturalist Club in, in influence in the sense that we discuss ideas and, and if ideas manifested into action and today's event. The other avenues have a little bit more red tape, so we need to work out the, the bureaucracy part of that. But it doesn't mean it won't happen. So I appreciate and I'm glad you point out that there needs to be more public outreach. Um, if we have time, I'll tell you all a very funny story about lack of public outreach and, and curry dinosaurs. Okay. The challenge to witness a candidate and a researcher, they have a task in the data. So they may be different stages of the process. Some may be doing in lab research, some may be doing in some may be doing some other tasks of the technical research. They have all the same things. Or they have all the and the, the other thing we have to consider is because we'll be on the grounds of our oil field company, they have their HSC policies and protocols that we will have to conform with as well. Number of persons, what HSC gear we need, all, all of these things. So um, all of these are logistics that we work on. Another thing we've been thinking about is how do we reach out to the I have two questions online. One was about the GBIF website, but I see Stephanie Tran. Stephanie Tran is one of my interns, very proud of her. Stephanie, just put the GBIF link on to the chat website. For those of you that want the GBIF link to look for any more biodiversity stuff, we could send it as a WhatsApp message or um, an email. But Stephanie is also asking about CITES and other regulations for fossils. So, so far, the fossils that come to Trinidad 
they're not under any CITES regulations or anything like that because, well, um, they, they're all animals, the animal tissue that, well, no longer existed, not endangered, they're dead already. So, so th th there's one. But in terms of the regulations, Trinidad has strange regulations with regards to fossils. The word fossil only appears in Trinidad's regulations, all the laws of Trinidad and Tobago once, and it's in the National Trust Act. No, and this is why we came to the National Trust initially, because it was the only piece of legislation that addressed fossils. Back in 2019, when we had the first workshop, we met with several stakeholders from Ministry of Energy, Ministry of Planning, um, Wildlife Section, all discussing what would be the process of repatriation of fossils? What paperwork is needed? Who do we get a letter from? Ministry, of, there was one discussion, maybe it should be Ministry of Energy because it's a mineral technically, Ministry of Energy said that, that is true, but we don't give um, paperwork for fossils because we just never did that in the past. So it's hard to start that now. Ministry of Planning said, oh yes, National Trust, that's our line ministry. So the, the, we were directed to the National Trust. Um, veterinary services said, well, it's no animal tissue, so it's not us, it's not public health. Wildlife section said, but you have species names, so maybe it should be us. So when the first batch of fossils was repatriated, we had a wildlife permit to bring in specimens, okay? And up to this day, that is, the o that is the only documentation we have from Trinidad and Tobago indicating we could bring in fossils, okay? Now, where does that put us now? Because the National Trust, the last time I brought fossils in, I had a letter from the National Trust indicating that these were items for natural heritage that would be brought back to Trinidad, okay? And Customs and Excise Division didn't like that, okay? So we now, we still have to figure out what's the proper way to, to deal with repatriation of fossils, but then, uh, it was also pointed out to me, we could buy a fossil on Amazon and it'll come through a skybox. Okay, exactly. Yeah, so, you know, it has several loopholes in the legislation. It has several issues with the regulations, how to bring these things in. But the bottom line is our fossils don't have the necessary legislation for protection. To this day, if someone wants to do an excavation, a foreign entity wants to do an excavation in Trinidad, I think they might be able to leave with a fossil without actually any repercussions. Yeah. So yeah, we see it with we see we see it with archaeological specimens as well. So so yeah, go ahead. So um and this is at least uncertain is that Thank you. 
weeks and excited to speak up for the fact that I like to do very This is up there. It's in the evening and good time. But it's like, you know, I don't know if it's natural or if I have to read definition or I'm going to do it in the Today is great. What time is this? Is it So, so previously we did have that line of providence where a letter was issued from the Labrea Tappet Museum indicating they convey custodianship to the UE's World Museum and it, with the second batch, the National Trust. Right. So, yeah, uh, I mean, once you start to go the route of a broker, the grant doesn't cover the cost for a broker. Okay, so so there's that. Yeah. If I was to follow something in the United States, they will have a Yeah. Then they go to Yeah. So, yeah. If I found sort of someone Right, and this is where, um, well, one, because it's, it's still classed as a natural item, it doesn't fall under the antiquities. Because when I check the antiquities section of the Museum Act, the, yes, the Trade Act, it didn't cover natural yeah. items. So that's why we had to throw it out from that yeah. avenue. Yeah. So, yeah. exactly, Minerals Act, Ministry of Energy again. Yeah. So, they may have their controls because the people that are shipping things out the same how we see that check out. And they may have agreements between. So when it left, it left the same way it came in, yeah. in a suitcase. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. That's giving it a premium. Yeah. That's showing an economic thing. But what it falls into, this is a clover, is that we have three concentric solutions in the middle of it. Is
Wenn wir das verlieren, dann ist es schon, dass wir das verwachsen. Die Gäste haben das auch so. Die Wahrheit ist aber, an der Achtung, wenn man es ist, nicht ein Mm-hmm. Protection inside. And nice one, I thought that was a good thing. 
Okay, this is the cycle. It's very short. There is a national trust. Uh, right. It's a whole spot of money for some business sake. But mm -hmm. still, it still needs to be Yeah. So that's why you said, I think it was exciting that people here uh, were working for this process and different things. And it's not going to be a good conversation. We research with them all the time. Thank you. All right. Thanks, John. So, um, if anyone else has any other questions uh, or comments, um, no, I guess those. Um, I was just wondering, like, um, in terms of what you would do, not something that um, uh, process samples when they are found, and if you know this. Yeah, so I would say there's varying classes of different states that uh really trade about the right to the What we're trying to do is work with the universities to have a workshop while working at the end, where we have comparators from the market to file and train people here and also figure out which chemical is necessary. So for example, we have our Here, um, so there's certain possibilities for that. The goal is we take the expertise 